sermon. Let's stand, please, for the reading of God's Word. John writes to us and says, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white, with palm branches in their hands. They cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, singing, Amen, blessing and, and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might to be, our, to, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they that, who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason they are before the throne of God, and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more, and they will thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And He will guide them to the springs of the water of life. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. The Word of God for the people of God. All right, here's a pop quiz. See if anybody ever pays attention to what I'm doing up here. Have I preached from Revelation before here? No? Yes? I'll take Phyllis's uh, over everybody else's nose. Where? I did, didn't I? It was my first sermon. I forgot about that. I thought I'd preached from Revelation here. See how everybody else's memory is failing. At least one person paid attention to my first sermon. I love the, the, the letter uh, of Revelation. It is, it is a wonderful, wonderful, hopeful, and hope-filled letter. Probably the most hopeful letter in all of Scripture. We always look at it and we say, oh, it's doom and gloom and it's prophecy from somewhere down the road. And, and that's the furthest thing from the truth. Uh, I've always told folks, you know, you can fill a church. It, it doesn't take a lot to fill a church. All you have to do is start preaching out of Revelation and Daniel and telling everybody that the end is fixing to happen and this is what you've got to do. And people start rushing in. You think I'm kidding you? I've watched it happen. Well, the problem with that is they're, they're, they're not really reading the Scripture. You know, Revelation is a letter that is written to a group of people who were being persecuted because of their belief. It was, it was almost... Uh, there, there's a, a psalm that says, how do we sing the songs to the Lord in a foreign land? That's kind of what this is about. Uh, how, do we be, how can we be a Christian in a world that is not Christian? Is what, what the whole emphasis is. You know, these are folks that not only had a bad week. And see, this is what I like about Revelation. Is if you've had a bad week where nothing seems to go right, that... That every time you try to turn around, something else is tempting you to go the opposite direction in which way you know you're supposed to go. It, there are times when we may feel that God has taken a vacation, as what, uh, what the uh, Jews said of God during the Holocaust, that God had taken a vacation. I think all of us have probably been there at some point in time, if we're honest with ourselves, to where we are just spiritually dry, that we are tired of fighting the world and just says, I'll just go along with what the world wants, you know. I'll do my Christian thing on Sunday morning. You know, I'm not going to try to live that every day because it's just too hard. That's what was going on with these people. They were struggling every day because what the world said was, because these are craftsmen. These are, uh, are, are folks that have a crafts guild or a, a union, if you will. And the union hall said you've got to come down and have the pagan feast with us. And they're saying, no, we can't do that because that's against my Christian beliefs. So they're saying, well, you can't be a part of the, the union, which means you can't do your craft. So you see where the, 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 the dilemma they're in here. 
They're trying to figure out how to be Christian in a world that didn't know Christ. They're not a lot different than what we live in today. They needed encouragement. So the letter writer paints this beautiful picture of the reward for the faithful. Just when they thought there was no light at the end of the tunnel, John gives them hope with this letter. He says, after this, well, if you ever see after this, you've got to go back and see what they're talking about, right? They have just had the sealing of the martyrs, those who were willing to die for their beliefs. I like what Viktor Frankl says. Uh, he, he always said that it's not what we're willing to die for, but what we're willing to live for, that hope that is out there that nobody can take away. And that's where these folks are. It says they are the martyrs that have been sealed. They've been rewarded because they were faithful. And they're sealed in the kingdom. It says, after this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count. Y'all all know the joke that says, you know, that when you get to heaven, there's going to be a lot of folks kicking themselves. Because they thought they were the only ones going to get there, right? What does it say? It says, and I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count. Because they had come to believe. That was the teaching that only the Jews were going to make it to paradise, right? They were to believe that it was a small... <coughs> <coughs> I'm not contagious, by the way. I'll just let you know. I, I kind of wish I was. That way they could kick this thing, you know? Anyway... They had come to believe that there was only a few folks that were going to get to heaven. And John says, no, when I look out, there are all those that are faithful to God that will be in the paradise. From every nation, uh-oh, from every nation, from all the tribes and peoples and languages. Whoops. I thought it was just going to be Methodist up there. <laughs> Some Methodist. Some I'm not sure where they're going. They've been taught that the Jews were the chosen people, right? But what does John say? No, you are the chosen ones because God has touched you. And if you're faithful, the ones that of all nations, all tribes, all peoples, and all language. It also says, you're not in this boat alone. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when we're struggling and when we are hurting that we think we're the only one with that particular problem? We're not alone. Whenever you have a problem, guess what? There are other people in this world that have the same thing. That will reach out and help you. And that's what he's saying. That you're not alone. You may think that you're the only ones that are being pushed down. You may think you're the only ones trying to be a Christian in an unchristian world. But you're not alone. There's a great multitude from all nations, not just here. From all languages. I love that part, by the way. You know what happens at Babel, right? Their languages are spread out and pushed away. Here it says they're all brought back together in Christ. Isn't that beautiful imagery? I like it. Sometimes I just, things I like. But, hmm. Anyway, it says they're a great, great multitude standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The faithful ones have come out victorious over the persecutors. And now they stand before God. Now, think about the folks that are struggling. The folks that are being pushed down because of their beliefs. Think about those folks. Don't you think this would be a hopeful sign for them? Don't you think they would say, gosh, I can, I can go on. I'm not the only one. And, and if I'm faithful, I get to stand before the throne with with white robes and palm branches, the, the, the robe of immortality and the, the palm branches of thanksgiving and of victory. If you ever want to read where this comes from, by the way, this whole imagery comes from, uh, it's in the Apocrypha, in es, es, Esdra 2. Uh, it's the same story. Mm. They cried out in a loud voice saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. They're able to sing of the faithfulness of God and of the Lamb who saved them from the wrath to come. Understand again the context. These people are trying to live out their Christian beliefs in an unchristian world. John is saying there is nothing in this world that will save you for eternity. 
we think that there are things in this world that will save us for eternity. We think that our money, our cars, our possessions, or whatever else will save us for this world to the world to come. Mm -mm. Worked at a funeral home too long. I ain't never seen a trailer hit you on the back of a hearse, okay? Just ain't going to take it with you. It's <laughs> they, 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 they. We look to things sometimes to save us. Things to give us meaning. This is what gives us meaning. It's our relationship with Christ. It's not our relationship with anything else but with Christ. And our only salvation comes from God. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God. Not only. Not only are those on earth, the redeemed on earth, singing praises, but so are the angels in heaven and the elders and those that are in the heavenly realm. Now, think about this. When you're down and out, you've got to understand that there are folks there for you and the great cloud of witnesses. You know, whenever you read that passage, we always read it, and we th it's really good at funerals. You know, you read about it, but it's an active role that the great cloud of witnesses play. They're there on our behalf, and they are all falling on their face. Hey, <laughs> They are bowed down on their face. They're not raising their arms in the air. They're bowed down on their face in humility and vulnerability before the throne. These are they who have come out. The question is asked, who are these folks? It says, these are they who have come out of the great ordeal. These are the ones that have been faithful to God through all the persecutions. Think about the times. It happens to us every day. This isn't anything new to us. Every day we have to make a choice. Do we go the way of the world or do we go the way that Christ wants us to go? Most of us take the path of least resistance, right? Let's be honest with ourselves. We take the path of least resistance. So, we'd rather do, a lot of times, we'd rather do what is popular versus what is right. Do you agree with that? Good. Look what it says. Now here, I think, is the pivotal role, uh, verse in here. It says, They washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They washed their robes. You know, those things, you know, people always say, Oh, don't worry about it. God will provide. God will take care of you. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Well, God will provide the worm for the bird. Okay? But the bird got to get out of that nest and go down there and get it. God don't just drop the worm in the nest. Right? See, there's a, there is a responsibility on our part. It shows us that we have to wash our robes. We have to, we have a part to play in working out our salvation. We, we have a role in this, folks. It's not just, here, I've done this for you. I'm done. We have to, we have to, we have to do something. We've got to be the one that goes in there. Think about it like this. We don't just sit in a bathtub and let the water roll over us and that means we're clean, right? Been out playing, we got mud up from our head to our toe and we just sit there. Or do you take a bath rag and scrub yourself clean? That's what it is. We have a role to play. It says, the Great Commission, which we all love to quote, right? Go ye therefore and make disciples. Of, you know that one? We love that one, right? But we don't pay attention to it. It doesn't say anything about go ye therefore and make members of your church. It says go ye therefore and make disciples. We have a role to play in our salvation and in our growth. It's not just handed to us and say here. We have to wash our own robes in the blood of the Lamb. Because it is only through that blood that we are redeemed. Not the length of membership or number of degrees. We are responsible for washing our robes in the blood of the Lamb. The new robe. How many times do they use this imagery in, in the New Testament? About putting on new clothes. When you are washed with the blood, you should have a new robe on. A new character. A new person. That's what he's trying to tell these people. 
You're different than everybody else that is in that drink union, craftsman union. You're different. You have a new robe on. You're a different person. You're, you're a new character for this reason. For this reason, pay attention. What reason? Let's go backwards again. Because you have washed your robe white in the blood of the Lamb. Then you are before the throne. Only those who are active participants in their own salvation stand before the throne. And it says, and they worship Him day and night. I have a hard time getting y'all to stay past 10. It says we worship day and night. In other words, always. And everything that we do should be an act of worship to God. <clears throat> if we are busy, here's the thing, if we are busy working out our salvation and spending time in the feast with God, then we ain't got no time to get in trouble. You know? And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. If we're working out, pardon me, if we are working out our salvation and being active in our discipleship, then we're sheltered. Now again, remember the context. These are folks who are wondering if it's worth the cost to, to be faithful. And John says, absolutely. The reward is wonderful. They will hunger no more. No longer. Once we wash our robes and become a new person, then we hunger no more for meaning in our life. That's what they say. Everything you read about, especially my generation, they're looking for meaning. What gives me meaning? He says, this is what gives you meaning. You don't have to hunger for that anymore. Once you have washed your robe, in the blood of the Lamb. <coughs> in thirst, no more. Once we have access to the living water, we have new life and are refreshed in that water. It says the Lamb will be our shepherd. Y'all realize what it means to be a shepherd? You know, folks that have ever had cattle, they know they put cows out there and they eat and whenever they get fat enough, they get sliced. And we have prime rib, right? But sheep are different. Sheep are very different. Sheep you have to, to care for because their money for the person is not in their meat, it's in their wool. So it's a real intimate relationship the shepherd has with the sheep. Sheep are dumb, by the way. They will walk off a cliff if, they, if they'll follow right off the cliff. Right? But it says, don't worry, the shepherd was going to guide you. The shepherd is going to protect you. The shepherd is going to lead you to the, to the living water. You see, once we wash our robe in the blood of the Lamb and we're washed clean, then the Lamb will be our shepherd and keep us safe. To feed us on His Word, to refresh us in the living water. And this is more than head knowledge, folks. The people this letter was addressed to knew all too well the struggles a faithfulness to God in a secular world. We're bombarded daily with, with temptations to follow other gods. We're told, just this once and no more. What harm is that? This letter is very plain. If we want to see the throne of God, then we must be actively faithful everywhere and always. Amen.